Amen. Bonjour. Joel Egoison, Disney Cross. Um, welcome back to this multi part series of the history of Turtle Island. Um, I believe we're going to call this part two. I uh, hope you're enjoying the lesson so far. And um, miigwech for joining me. And um, you guys take care out there. One of the first things um, that the Europeans brought to this land, and initially, initially uh, it was unintentional, um, was diseases. Smallpox being one of the most commonly known diseases that came from Europe to these lands. Now, a European immune system had built strong immunities to smallpox. Someone from Europe would get the spots, um, they would get sick, maybe the fever, just kind of like chicken pox is today, but they would fight that off and they would survive. For 15,000 years, First Nations people had zero immunities to these diseases that came across the ocean. Um, and they were devastating. Uh, I, I've heard numbers in the first 200 years, up to 90% of the indigenous population was decimated from disease, 90%. So you have 100 million people in 1492, and then by 16, let's say 1700 to round it up, now you're down to 10 million people. 90% of the population was wiped out in the first 200 years just from contact. And the majority of those nations that were wiped out were here, again, on the eastern seaboard, because that was first contact with Europeans. These nations, many, many of these nations are gone from the planet maybe forever. Um, it's hard to tell exactly how many nations have disappeared. Again, the number I have is 500 nations, but that number is most likely higher. And today it's my understanding that there's still about 173 different dialects of First Nations languages spoken here in Turtle Island. So that doesn't exactly translate to the nations, but it does translate to me to cultures that survive. Because for our people, our language really connects to our culture. The way we speak connects to the earth, connects to our spirit, um, and relates directly to our culture. So today there's about 173 um, dialects remaining, um, 173 languages left. And again, that number could be higher. Um, but as you can see, this is a really big difference between these numbers. That's 327 languages 327 nations, cultures, that are gone from the face of the earth forever. Um, and we're talking about an entire nation, an entire culture and group of people that's gone from this planet forever. Um, in many cases, what you're talking about is genocide. Now, the first thing I said was, in many instances, these diseases were brought here unintentionally. But once they were here, um, it became kind of a tool, kind of a biological weapon for the settlers that were after the resources of these lands. And that's what we kind of need to get to next, I think, is, is the way that we viewed these lands. First Nations culture, again, if you watch my other videos, we connect to our planet, to Mother Earth, in everything. Our language, the way that we live, everything that we do in our culture has to do with keeping the earth beautiful and pristine, not for us, but for seven generations of children to come. We do not own this planet. We are borrowing this planet from our children. And that was the mentality of all of these First Nations. For 15,000 years we lived here, and in all of those thousands of years, we barely left a footprint on this beautiful planet. And it wasn't easy. It was more difficult to live the way that we did guaranteed this, this luxury that we live in today um, is nice, but it hurts our planet. You can't argue that. And everything that we did was to make sure that we did not leave a big footprint so that our children had just the beautifulest place to live. And not just our children, we're talking about those seven generations, our great, 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 great grandchildren. We wanted to make sure that they had a beautiful home to live in. And that's the way that we lived our lives every day, was to maintain the beauty of this land forever. And when the Europeans arrived, they brought with them many things. <clears throat> they brought with them their language, 
They brought with them their way of thinking. They brought with them their economy and their need for more. When they saw the beautiful untouched forests of North America, they didn't see habitat and a part of creation for, for all of those beautiful creatures. They saw money, right? They said, man, ooh, we're gonna chop down those trees and we're gonna make billions. And they did, and we do, right? Canada's lumber exports are what kind of drives our economy here in these lands to this very day. When they saw all the animals, when, when Europeans first arrived here, there was 400 million beavers, is the number that I've researched. 400 million beavers. That's crazy. Imagine how the land would shape and move with their dams and the way they influenced the environment. But they didn't see God's creature and part of creation. They saw fur. They saw money. Right? Ooh, man, we're going to harvest these furs. We're going to send them back to Europe. We're going to make billions. And they did. Right? The fur trade was what drove the Canadian economy for 300 years before we overhunted our beavers. Today, it's my understanding, there's about 4 million beavers left in North America of the 400 million when Europeans arrived. Um, and I'd like to preface a little bit too. When I say the word European, I, I really want to, you know, I'm referring to those settlers that came from across the ocean. It was mostly British, French. Early on, it was Dutch and Spanish. Um, so. When I say European, I'm gonna, I'll try to be more specific. It's hard for me to label all of the nations that came here and the governments that continue to control this land today. Um, but just know that's kind of who I'm talking about when I say the word um, Europeans, because I don't want to label all five of the British and French and Spanish governments that came across. So just so you know that. So it was a very different way of thinking. Again, when they came here, they saw money and they saw ways to make money. When we looked at this land, we just saw Mother Earth, this beautiful planet that takes care of us, gives us everything that we need. And again, our main priority was those seven generations of children to make sure she was here and healthy and strong for them, not for us, for them. So now, more and more boats are coming, more and more boats are coming. Every day boats are arriving on the shores of the, of the new world. Um, and more and more disease is affecting the East Coast. Now, if there was a nation who was in prime territory, prime farmland, let's say, and they weren't cooperating, they're being difficult, they don't want to leave, it was very simple for the European settlers to get rid of that nation. All they had to do was go to the smallpox ward in the hospital, round up some blankets off of those uh, patients, and again, well, my, my people didn't purchase things, we bartered, we traded for things. Again, I talked about those vast trading networks all across Turtle Island. So the settlers would take those blankets to that nation, offer a nice trade for whatever it was that they wanted, and all they had to do was sit back and wait for a couple months, and that entire nation, that entire village, that whole community would be gone. It didn't matter, babies, elders, the strongest warriors, when smallpox ravaged a village, it decimated the entire nation, the entire group of people. And we are talking about intentionally infecting an entire group of people who died from smallpox. You were talking about genocide. That is intentionally murdering an entire culture for the resources of the land in which they inhabit. And I'd like to say that happened once in North America. Um, there's multiple um, research that I've done in multiple sites all up and down the eastern seaboard where that occurred. So, so we know that to be true in many instances. It wasn't always accidental, the disease and the genocide. Um, smallpox was really one of the first biological weapons that was used in battle here in North America and then later on in South America as well. <clears throat> so the disease decimated our population. By 1700, we're down to 10 million. We're getting weaker. We're still powerful. 10 million versus, again, the hundreds of thousands maybe that have come off the boat in those first 200 years. Um, and at this point, again, there's still no real lines on the map. There's nations all across these lands. So the power begins to shift during this time frame. Um, and it's these nations here in the east that were really wiped out the most because all up and down this seaboard were hundreds and hundreds of different nations living here. 
Um, many friendships were created during the fur trade wars, but remember there was British, there was French, there was Spanish, so what also started to happen during this time when economy was introduced to us and greed and things and more and more kind of mentality, um, we began to adopt that mentality. We began to kind of hunt more than we needed. You know, prior to contact, we took just what we needed. We used every bit of that animal to honor the life that just, was just taken. Um, and that was it until we needed more. But now with the coming of the European settlers and the introduction of the fur trade and money, um, we began to overhunt the beaver. We began to overhunt other things for fur. We began to think and learn like the settlers that were coming to these shores. We began to fight each other over the resources of these lands and see those resources not as the future of our children, but for a way for, to better ourselves in this lifetime. Once we get into these, these 1700s, now we're going to start to talk a little bit more about conflict. Um, because after the first 200 years of contact with our, our European brothers and sisters, uh, those settlers that came across the ocean, um, it was no longer here. We'd gotten away from this by then. It was no longer, welcome, brothers and sisters, we've been expecting you. Um, we began to see the ways of those settlers, and the conflicts began to arise in the 1700s. The way um, settlement kind of went was um, the settlers would build forts along the East Coast. Those forts would turn into towns, you know, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, Boston, all along the East. Um, and as time went on, they would move westwards, and they'd build another fort. And they'd fortify that really good until the indigenous population was taken care of um, or they were no longer an issue. And then that would turn into a town, right, around that fort. And then they would march again a little more west and they would build um, another fort. And it was slowly moving across North America. 1492, Europeans arrived here for the first time. It wasn't until 1886 that the railway um, was completed all the way across North America. So you do the math, that's the better part of 400 years it took to fully settle um, the entire middle part of North America. Um, it's, a very, it's a very long journey. Now, this here, around the Great Lakes, um, this is just kind of a rough sketch, but this is basically Ojibwe territory. And that's me, I am Ojibwe. Um, we had a very large territory. We were a very powerful nation. Uh, but for the most part, we were peaceful. Um, we have warrior clans that are in charge of our battle strategy, kind of like our generals and admirals when it was time to go to war. Um, but for the most part, we made allies with our neighbors. We had the Three Fires Confederacy with the Potawatomi and Odawa. We had the dish with one spoon that um, tied us to the Iroquois and to the Wendat, the different nations around these Great Lakes. So we did our best to live um, in peace with each other, to make sure, again, that everything was for our future generations of our children. Now, over here in the middle part of Turtle Island, we have the Great Plains, the prairies we call them in Canada, and the plains more so in the United States. This is where the buffalo live. Um, a lot of people think horses are from North America, but that's not true at all. Horses are not from these lands. Cows, chickens, and pigs, those are all European domesticated farm animals that were brought on boats from Europe to these lands. Today, we got lots of all those things. In the 1700s, I think it was 1723, I want to say, <clears throat> right around here, the Spanish had settled down in this area, what is now kind of Mexico, Texas area. Um, <clears throat> and the Spanish met the tribes of, uh, of the plains. <laughs> now again, the Ojibwe were powerful warriors, but that wasn't our focus and our culture. Many of these tribes in the plains, these were warrior societies. They didn't have one clan that focused on, <clears throat> on war. The entire society was a warrior society. Um, in part because the buffalo migrated, so they were constantly ca crossing into each other's territories as they followed that great resource um, that was the uh, tens of millions of buffalo that roamed North America during these times. Um, so the Spanish brought horses, Spanish Mustangs, over to the Plains area at this time. 
a great war was fought between the Spanish and the tribes of these prairies, the plains. Um, and again, these guys were fierce. They easily defeated the Spanish army. They pushed them back into the ocean, and the Spanish began to migrate farther south during this time. And of course, we didn't kill all of their horses. We opened up the gates, and we allowed those Spanish Mustangs to roam free in the plains. And this is the time where the horse warrior was born. This is the first time that North America was introduced to these wild stallions roaming the grasslands um, with those buffalo. These guys were already some of the fiercest warriors on the planet, guerrilla style fighters. You would be dead before you heard the arrow. You wouldn't see him coming and you would have already lost your life. And now they got horses. Now they can ride across the prairies like, like the wind, right? These beautiful creatures that could be tamed. Um, they became a real part of the culture of these tribes during that time in the, in the 1700s. And right around this time, this is when the European settlers are about to enter their territory. And they're about to meet their match with these guys. Um, these guys knew who was coming at this point. 200 years later, it wasn't welcome friends from across the ocean, we've been expecting you. It was, no, they've seen the death and destruction and genocide that's happened to their brothers and sisters on the East Coast as a result of contact with these settlers. So what they did was um, they put up a wall. I mean, not a real wall, um, but they said, nope, that's as far as you guys are going. They burnt the existing forts that may have already been in this area here, and they told those settlers, no more. You guys have gone far enough west, and that's that. Um, and obviously, the settlers and the governments that were here at that time did not like that. So they actually declared war. In the late 1700s, um, there was a war declared by what was not the United States government at that time, but um, the governments and people in control at that time declared war on the First Nations of the Plains during this time frame. Um, they call it the Indian Wars. And the Indian Wars actually lasted 60 years. 60. Six old Indian Wars. We've declared war on nations. That goes on until the war comes to some sort of end. There's actually three other wars in the United States history that went on during this time that they declared war, but they were not going any farther west during that time as long as that war was on. So, um, <clears throat> Again, there wasn't a really big battles that were won by the European settlers that, that I've researched. These guys, uh, you, you've seen European fighting styles, right? You watch movies. I, I grew up, again, learning history from settlers and watching their movies. And you're the king, and you got 10,000 guys, right? And you're the queen, so, and you got your 10,000 guys. And we're going to meet in this big field. And you got yours, and I got mine. And we're going to just have a war, right? And whoever has guys remaining wins that battle. That was not the warfare style of these guys. Again, guerrilla warfare fighters. Um, and, and the other issue is, in European fighting style, if I want to fight you, I know right where your castle is. I know right where to go to challenge you to a battle. We were nomadic, right? We moved around with the seasons. We moved with the herds and the winds and the animals. We built our camp, we packed it up, we moved if the fishing wasn't good. We had a spring camp, a summer camp, a fall camp, right? We were always on the go, moving with Mother Nature again, making sure we didn't leave too big of a footprint for the future of our children. So it was very frustrating for these soldiers because they're gonna go in, they're gonna line up their battalion and all their horses and infantry, and they're gonna march into those plains to kick some butt. Problem is, they don't know where they're going. <laughs> the last information they had about where this tribe was they haven't been there for quite some time. And on their way there, they're now surrounded and they're getting picked off one by one. For the most part, again, I don't, I've never read about a great battle one. I mean, they talked about the Battle of Wounded Knee and the Battle of the Little Bighorn. But if you really dig into that research, all the warriors were gone at Wounded Knee. Those American soldiers slaughtered women and children and elders that were left behind at the, at the community in, in those days. But back in the East Coast, the papers read, great victory at Wounded Knee. Um, but in most cases, that's not how it went down. These guys were the planet's deadliest warriors on horseback with bows and arrows. So they just kept marching horses and troops and guns and artillery in there looking for them. And all they kept doing was giving these guys more horses and guns and artillery um, for their cause. They were building up their arsenal 
trying to go in there and fight and hunt them on their territory. Um, it's just kind of the way it went down. So they couldn't really win a battle during this time frame. Um, so anyway, 60 years of war is, is happening here, kind of in these battle lines of the Great Plains that are happening, um, that, that kind of boundary. Now, after the first 50 years of trying to fight these tribes, um, and they're not having very much success and losing so much resources in the effort, um, they figured out a way to beat us, to beat those nations. They couldn't do it in a fight. They couldn't do it in a battle. But what they could do was take away their resources. They could take away their food. And if you remember, the resources and the food in the plains of North America were the bison, right? Were those buffalo. Um, as long as the buffalo were roaming in those plains, these guys were not going to be stopped. So in the last 10 years of the 60-year Indian Wars, um, it became the policy of the, United States, oh, of the governments at that time to slaughter every buffalo on Turtle Island. Um, a lot of people think that it was just a natural progression of settlers moving westward that killed all the buffalo, just happened, manifest destiny, they were meant to go. No, this was a, a policy that was put out there um, to slaughter the buffalo in order to starve the First Nations people into surrendering. Um, and it worked. It worked beautifully. Uh, today, when I teach kindergarten students and I, and I hold a picture of a bison, a North American bison, most of them don't even know what it is because they were almost wiped off the face of the earth during this time frame um, in, the, in, the late early, in the early 1800s. So it was a long time frame that spanned the Indian Wars. And again, during those last 10 years, the buffalo slaughter um, was the focus of the army and the settlers and the, the governments at that time. They put bounties on buffalo heads that were like five times what they were actually worth. Um, not the heads themselves, but the furs. So all of the settlers that were moving west would kill as many buffaloes and skin them as they could because the government was paying big bucks for those furs. Um, the soldiers would go on, on the train tracks or they'd ride into the prairies as far as they could when the herds were there and they would spend every bullet just killing as many buffaloes as they could. Um, not even harvesting the furs, just to decimate the population of those buffaloes to weaken the tribes here in this land. And it worked. After a decade of slaughtering the buffalo in North America and those policies, um, the buffalo were almost extinct. In the research that I've done, there was about 200 buffalo left, and they put them in a farm in Washington State, the final 200 buffalo, and they waited. They just sat back, and after two or three years of starving and suffering, um, those tribes, those powerful warrior nations laid down their arms, and they surrendered. And that was the end of the Indian Wars. And then the settlers were free to continue their migration westward, to continue that train tracks all the way across from east coast to west. So now we're getting into uh, <clears throat> 1800s. This is kind of a big general picture that I'm, that I'm showing you guys and stating because in the plains this is the number where really things start to go bad for these tribes but again it was long before 1850 where the East Coast tribes were suffering like these middle part of the plains were about to um, start to endure as well. Um, up here in Canada we also had our own kind of revolution. Talk about Pontiac's rebellion. There's there's hundreds of stories and hours and hours I could teach you guys about the different things that were going on, but Pontiac was, a, again, a, a great warrior from these lands, um, much like Tecumseh. And Pontiac rallied the nations together to fight back the British. Again, the time of welcome, brother, and, you know, share together, all of those promises had been broken. They were all lies. And by this time in the 1750s, 1760s, we knew this. <clears throat> and we were not going to take any more. So Pontiac and his crew began to burn the British forts. And again, in his words, we began to push them back into the ocean. Um, and that was in 1763 when the Royal Proclamation was created. Right? The king had heard of, all, of the rebellion and what was happening, and he was terrified. I'm like, they're, they're pushing us back, back to Europe. So he wrote this grand Royal Proclamation, which I'm not going to get into too much, but. Um, that is one thing that I did learn in history was about this royal proclamation 
Um, what I didn't hear about was Pontiac's Rebellion and the reason <laughs> the Royal Proclamation was created. Um, Anishinaabe, First Nations warriors, man, we were fierce, fierce warriors, and we were known um, for our prowess as warriors. Always makes me think about uh, that movie 300 Day where he looks back at his soldiers and says, what is your profession? Ah, uh, and they just, they all pound it up. Because that's what we did, man. We trained from, from little, little children. Um, we our, sharpened our skills as warriors and hunters, you know? That's, that's how we lived in these lands. So um, I encourage you guys to do your own research and study Pontiac's Rebellion a little more. Study a little bit more about Tecumseh and his strategies. In America, there's so many great stories as well that just aren't told in, in our textbooks in schools. So um, I encourage you guys to look back at that. Um, so the buffalo are gone. Um, we're talking about now middle of the 18, 1800s. Nations are starving, and this is all across the plains, up here too. Now we're talking about the time with Sir John A. Macdonald, if you're in Canada, was, uh, he was on this mission as well to starve the First Nations people out of this beautiful prime farmland here in Canada. Um, again, I'm not gonna get into any details. I really kinda wanna paint a broad picture when we're talking about this history, because for me, it wasn't about specifics, it was about how did we get from this to this today. Okay, I really don't want to make these lessons too long, especially for, for posting purposes. So um, I think we'll take a, another little break there. So um, guys, take a break and start with the next one. Totally up to you. Miigwech. I'll see you soon.